Hola, muchas gracias por venir. Eh, el trabajo de Marisa Olson, nacida en Alemania y residente de Nueva York, combina su práctica en video, performance, arte web, dibujo e instalación para generar un discurso de la historia cultural de la tecnología, la política y la participación en la cultura popular, la experiencia de género y la estética de lo fallido. Su fascinación con la tecnología, la música, la cultura DIY y los, me los medios digitales en el arte han resultado en su colaboración no solo como artista, sino también como crítica, curadora y columnista en publicaciones como Rhizome del New Museum, Art Review y Art on Paper. Olson también fue miembro fundador del Nasty Nets Internet Surfing Club, un colectivo de arte web que documenta y hace remixes de sus experiencias en el Internet, mismo que presentó su primer DVD en el Festival de Sundance. Marisa Olson. Thank you so much. I have to apologize that I don't speak Spanish. I'm embarrassed that I don't. It's such a beautiful language. In fact, my bio sounds that much better in Spanish than it does in English. So thank you for having me here. It's really an honor. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming. And um, as you heard, my work is very interdisciplinary. In fact, I thought it would be fun to just kind of scroll through my web page for a moment and just let you see th sort of thumbnail images giving you a sense of the different types of projects I've done and you can even just some of them are dead web images <laughs> you can just get a sense of you know what a book different formats so it's performance video installation net art, sound art, many different types of things. Um, for me, I often um, think about what I'm doing almost like I'm running a lab in a certain sense. A, I guess a laboratia is the Spanish word. <laughs> Let's see, this is why I'm not speaking in Spanish. I would butcher the language. Um, I'm more interested in, in sets of questions or um, concepts as a starting point, and then I will think about what the best form is for trying to answer that question at any given time. So questions about experiences of gender, questions about um, the relationship between politics and pop culture, as you heard, or um, questions about the history of technology. And then I will perform experiments. And at times it'll come out as an installation or a performance or a relationship between the two. And sometimes it is about what the relationship is between art and audience in the first place. So I'm going to show you um, kind of three different bodies of work that have played themselves out over the last 10 years, really. And I'll, I'll try to just restrict myself to about um, up to 10 minutes for each of those bodies of work, and then that way we'll have more time for questions and more of a conversation, because if anything, I'm really more interested in generating conversation with my work than anything else. Um, in fact, oftentimes, I'll use the, the English phrase conversation piece um, to describe my work. I'll just sort of say, whatever I'm making, whether it is a sculpture, uh, a video or performance, I'm just making something to put down on the table, to bring people to the table, to have a conversation. And those are sort of English idioms I'm realizing now, but it's sort of how I think about things. So let me start um, with two projects that I did that were related to, uh, I'm not used to PCs. Will that go away by itself probably? Okay, sweet. Um, I did two projects that were related to the television show American Idol. Um, let's see if I can try to make this a little bit bigger for you. Cool. Um, so um, this is this project is called Marissa's American Idol Audition Training Blog. And uh, it started when I put myself in training to audition for American Idol. Um, and I thought of this as a sort of endurance performance project where I would keep a diary of training exercises. Can you guys hear me with everything going on? Okay, cool. Um, 
And I really wanted to critique the television show, even though I was a secret fan of the TV show. Um, I also felt like it did a lot of things that I didn't think were really great. So for instance, it, uh, the judges would tell women who were of average weight that they were too fat to have any talent or to be stars. Or they would tell guys that they were too not masculine enough to be famous or something like that. And so I really wanted to critique the gender norms that it was entrenching. So I would do these training exercises like walk around in stilettos for 36 hours. Or in this one, I wanted to get a look. And I decided to go for a California girl look. Um, and I went to the tanning salon. But instead of getting a tan, I got a full body rash. <laughs> um, of course, that's me in the tanning salon, tanning bed. Um, instead of, yeah, so when the New York Times wrote about this project and it started to take on a life of its own, I thought my family would be excited that the New York Times was writing about my art and instead they just read about me getting a rash and they, that was the beginning of them thinking that I was super crazy. Um, but anyway, um, then something really interesting started to happen, especially because this project was getting press. Um, th I did this project in 2004, and my audition was going to be in October, a couple weeks before a major presidential election in the United States between George Bush and John Kerry. And Everybody was saying that my generation was not showing up to vote in the presidential elections. And if they did, it might actually make a difference. Now, that was the same generation that was the prime demographic for American Idol. And American Idol is the show that is based on this idea of texting your vote and this democratic ideal that anyone can be a leader. And American Idol was the number one search term on the internet. And for some bizarre reason, if you searched for American Idol, my site came up number one, and their site came up number three. And for some other bizarre reason, people actually thought that my website was the real website for American Idol. So I was getting 30,000 hits a day for, from people who, again, were not involved in politics and not paying attention, but they were paying attention to me. And so my project changed course a lot. And I started talking to this captive audience of people about using your voice not just to sing but politically. And I started blogging about all of these other kinds of things in a way that wasn't activism, like taking to the street in the way that you're used to, but it was another way of thinking about pop culture and politics. And that was something that entirely shifted my life and my understanding of what an artist could do and what kinds of tools an artist could use, and the way that you could engage with your audience, and how real time <laughs> your work could sort of be. And it really, it, it really shifted so many things for me and was super exciting. Um, and then um, I actually did go to the auditions. Everyone was like, is this real or? a performance, and I said yes, both. Um, and they filmed me a lot, but um, they never aired anything because with all of the press, they figured out that I was kind of critiquing them and making fun of them um, somehow. <laughs> uh, and so then I made a fictional reenactment of my audition um, in the form of this video, which is too long to show in entirety here, but I'll... Um, I'll just show a little bit of it. Let's see. Uh, do we have, s we don't have sound probably. We do? Okay, awesome. Um, I wonder if I should start at the beginning. Let me f just play a little bit. Maybe I'll fast forward. This year they raised the age limit to audition for American Idol. 
So I decided to audition because I've always been a frustrated singer at heart. I decided about three months ahead of time to audition. But I fast forward. Serious training. And ah, I started doing sorry. things like uh, PC novice. <laughs> With my superstar. This is embarrassing. Sorry. I drove down to the Cow Palace early Monday morning and I stood in line for eight hours. Just so that I could get a seat to come back the next day and audition. So I came back really early the next morning with curlers in my hair. Welcome back to San Francisco. And waited and waited and waited. Oh, where hundreds are still waiting in the holding room. Actually, I found a way to cheat in line so that I could audition about four hours early, but still, I was exhausted. And everybody wanted me to get on American Idol. I didn't pee my pants! <laughs> I made it up to the producers for the first audition, and I had a copy of my New York Times article. And I showed it to the producers, and they went for it. So they passed me through to meet with the executive producers. What's going on with you? So then I had to wait more, and I met all these other people who wanted to audition, and a lot of them were not as good as me. No, 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 no! They were just wearing like fancy outfits or stupid outfits. No, 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 no! It's whatever. They were so bad. And I met with them. And they passed me through again because they really liked me a lot and they said that I had a lot of talent and that I was really good looking, um, of course. Coming up, true talent. So you're here because you are the next American Idol. Yes, I am. Plus the- They said that I was fabulous, that I was a really good singer and that I was hot. <laughs> goes on for nine minutes, um, and you do get to hear me sing quite a bit, but um, if you want to hear that special treat, you can find it online. Um, so anyway, I then um, after that, I continued to get really excited about working online, as you can imagine, and it, it may sound strange now, but at the time, um, blogs were this really new medium, and um, in fact, to start that blog, I called around a couple people to ask how to start blogs, and it took me, or how to start a blog, and it took calling Corey Archangel, who didn't know, and Jonah Peretti, who founded Huffington Post, and BuzzFeed, who was like, I'm not sure, but my sister is a comedian, and she has a blog. So, um, it, yeah, it, it was something I was really excited about. I did another one that the Whitney Museum commissioned, where I sang um, several different obscure blog posts to the, the tune of different musical genres. Um, and I started getting into genre itself and how um, spectatorship was something that was really performative. Um, and then I started this series of live performances and um, recorded videos called performed listening and oh what just happened did I just like click on something weird I clicked on something weird and I closed that video so I'll just play this other video from that series called performed listening that was one um, called black or white um, using Michael Jackson's uh, song black or white um, along with a um, really cool TV that Nam June Paik had um, modified um, called the Wobulator, where he took it apart and put magnets inside, and it makes the image distort, and I used it on a residency. Anyway, um, let me play a little bit of this, and then I'll tell you what you're looking at. What's going on here? Yes, I, 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 can, I hear can hear my, my echo. 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 And, and uh, the, the words, words are, coming are coming back, back on. on. Sorry, I'm, I'm embarrassingly proving myself to be a Mac person, not a PC person. 
I'm just going to stop um, clicking on things. I want, I want to geez. hear my own, my own words, words pouring, pouring back, back, back in on, in on, on top, top of me. me. It is wild, It is, wild, Izzy. It is, it is San Luis. I'm hearing, I'm hearing other things. things. The tenuousness. Bounce. Bounce. <laughs> I keep um, clicking on the wrong side. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so this, again, this is from a series called Performed Listening, and this piece is actually called Performed Listening Boomerang, and you just saw the kind of title moment of it. Um, so, yeah, again, and the series is called Performed Listening because I'm interested in how spectatorship to my mind, is a performative thing. People have this idea, there's a, an American expression, the couch potato, that often when we're, you know, the, the classic example is watching TV, but in general, when we're consuming information, we're just these kind of like passive entities letting information wash over us as if we're not actually doing something productive. But in fact, we really are, and it strips us of our power or our agency to say that we're not processing information. And it strips us of the potential to go out there and do something meaningful or political or creative or interesting to say that we're not. Um, so, but in this particular case, I was asked to be in an exhibition that was about the experience of art. And when I was on the, I was Skyping with the curators and I said, you know, everything that you're telling me about the show, about what it means to experience art and process art reminds me of this video that I, was always deeply inspired by ever since I first saw it in grad school that Richard Serra made with Nancy Holt, where, which you're seeing here on the left, where um, Richard Serra really is not very well known for his super important video art that he made in the early 1970s. In this case, 1974, he made this piece called Boomerang. Um, but he had this residency in Texas, and he sat uh, Nancy Holt down in the studio um, and he, she's wearing headphones and she's hearing a slight time delay of herself talking about the experience of hearing a slight time delay of talking about hearing. Um, and the title moment comes from when she says, you know, my voice goes out and comes back like a boomerang, but she's so jacked up by this process that she can't even say it. It's like she's sort of had a stroke and she's like boomeranging. And I said to these curators, you know, I love this video, but I, I'm constantly searching for it on YouTube and I never find it. I'm always wishing I could see it again. And the minute we got off the phone, I searched YouTube and it was finally there. And I thought, I could never make something as good for this show as this video. So I immediately sat down without having watched it in years and years and just watched it on YouTube with my headphones on and live recorded into my webcam me speaking the words as I was hearing them. So it was this this piece, the way I show it, you can see it's a screen cap here, and I show it as a net art piece with the YouTube video and my live recorded response video playing at the same time, loading as a perpetual loop that plays and loops live um, in response to each other, if that makes 
sense. It's kind of nerdy, but I hope that is clear. Um, okay, so this is the last um, body of work that I wanted to tell you about. Um, there's a video and a series of installations that relate to each other. Um, why don't I show you the installations first, and then um, I'll show you the video last as we're sort of wrapping up. So. Um, the installations are called time capsules, and I'll just kind of scroll through the images and then scroll back up and, and tell you what they're about. Um, as you can see, these are all old kind of relics or artifacts of old technologies. And I'm really interested in what I refer to as the cultural history of technology. I'm interested in what drives us, these are stills from that video, Golden Oldies, that I'll show you. I'm interested in what drives us to constantly invent and covet and buy and, you know, quote unquote, upgrade and then throw away um, these technologies and these technological objects. Um, and I call these time capsules, sorry, I'm trying to click out of this. I call these time capsules because um, I think of them in a couple of different ways. Thank you. Um, it started with the cassette tapes where obviously a tape is like a unit of time, like 30 minutes or 60 minutes. Um, but I also think of them as um, encapsulating cultural values. So this brownie camera, for instance, or um, any, any of these other objects in the series, they encapsulate all of the cultural values that were embedded in their being invented. Um, and in the person who produced them and in the factory that employed that person and the distribution channels, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and so they're all kind of these time capsules are all vessels of those values and the person who owned them and then the person who threw them away. Um, and then I sort of collect them. I have a little bit of a rescue complex, I will admit. I collect them and I paint them gold as a way to kind of try to preserve their value and also recognize the commodity fetishism that is embedded in these devices. Um, and then in the installations, um, let me go back to the image of the installations. For instance, let me show you this one with the computers. Um, you know, we're sort of, I'm sort of thinking about like, what is the life of these? Like, when these computers were made, each of these monitors or computers rolled along, I imagine them like on some conveyor belt, like they rolled off of the assembly line, and they were all sort of identical. And then it was delivered to somebody's house or somebody's office, and it became yours. And you stared at it all day, every day, and you, maybe you resented it, or you worshipped it, or you said little kind of like prayers to it, like, please, 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 oh my god, bring me good news, or don't fail me, or whatever, and you just looked at it every day, and maybe you even like touched it, or you caressed the screen, or something like that, if it's your phone, right? Um, and it became yours, and you had this kind of emotional, spiritual, special relationship to it. And then all of a sudden, when it was time to upgrade, you threw it away, and it went back to being nothing, or just an object, or garbage. And so this is from a recent show that I had in Prague a couple months ago. Um, I wanted to present it in this sort of Stonehenge type of like memorial installation that suggested this moment in the future where we would maybe, people would see these and just think, what are all of these things? And where did they come from? Like who made them? 
and they seem to be important, but what are they and how did they get here? Because they're not going to biodegrade or certainly not any time that we can foresee. So I don't know. I just think that they're interesting. And when you paint them all in this kind of gold uniform color, they actually become really pretty design objects too. So lastly, let me just show you um, this video that I mentioned. <laughs> I, I swear this isn't a performance. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, and I can talk over this as well because there's just this sort of ambient sound. Let me, how do I turn down the volume? Let me turn it down. Thank you, but can we turn the volume down? Where is the volume on here? Ah, oh, here we go. Um, perfect. Um, these are just, this is gonna be like two low excerpts from, I don't know what that says, I'm sorry. Um, these will be um, two little excerpts from what was a 32 minute performance, so I'll just tell you what it is and, and tell you a little bit more about this overall series. So this is called Golden Oldies, which is often a, a term that they'll use on the radio in the US for like old um, music hits from the 50s. Um, and obviously it's a bit of a corny joke for you know the gold, old technology. Um, and when I made this video, this was the beginning of this overall series, and um, I was thinking of this idea of, um, you know, the gold record, which is a way of commemorating selling a lot of records, obviously, but I was also thinking of this, uh, this is just a break in the excerpts. Um, I was imagining myself kind of like, <laughs> Honestly, I was thinking of myself as an alien who had come to Earth, <laughs> and I knew that there was information on all of these different generations of devices, like the record, the cassette tape, the CD, uh, um, the DVD, the VHS, etc. but I just didn't know how to get it out. Um, and I started this performance not knowing why I was so compelled to do this, and as soon as I finished this long performance where I was just following my instincts, I sat down and watched it and realized the reason. And it was because as I go through this, I drill the stuff, I chisel it, I hammer it. Each time I fail to get information out of this stuff, I just sweep it to the ground and move on to the next generation of media. And I realized that that's exactly what we do. We use and abuse our phones and our whatever, and then when we're done with it, we just throw it away. And we don't really necessarily think about where it goes. And I, you know, I started thinking to myself, how many phones have I had in my life? Because I'm kind of on that cusp. I grew up with landlines, and then I had cell phones. And I started thinking, I don't know how many phones I've had in my life, including my parents' landlines. And not only that, I don't know where the, all of them are now. Do you? How many phones have you had in your life, and where are they all now? So that's the kind of thing that I'm interested in my work. Um, and this is what I've been working on. Thank you for listening to me talk about it. And Daniel is going to moderate questions if you have any. Um, well, first of all, thanks for your talk and for uh, showing us your work. And another line of your work that is also um, Another line of your work that is also quite relevant and in which you have made like contributions is like your written work, your theoretical work. Um, what are like the connections or how like your theoretical work fits from your artistic work and vice versa? Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, that's. Thank you for asking me about that. Well. Um, 
I have written quite a bit, um, particularly about post-internet art, if that is maybe what you're suggesting. <laughs> um, it, it's really funny. I, last night at the opening party for Zona Mako, um, one of the galleries that shows my work, um, the gallery director was telling some artists that I coined the term post-internet art. And I said, oh, no, don't tell them that, because they won't talk to me again. <laughs> But yes, it happens to be true. Um, and so I've written a lot about, well, I've been, I started working very, very young um, as an artist and as a curator and a writer. And so I, for instance, with rhizome.org, I was their very first paid writer in the late 1990s. And I didn't even first start talking about post-internet art until 2006. Um, and so I've been writing along multiple strains trying to support the history of internet art and artists working and experimenting in technology um, for a long time. And then also lately I've been trying to um, just write about the history of technology and how it affects our everyday um, more in general. So for instance, I just wrote an article for The Guardian about um, the concept of information overload and internet addiction. And I'm now writing an article about um, the one of the last um, vinyl record factories, which is in a very small town outside of Prague, which I got to visit um, when I had my exhibition there. And so it's been one of my goals um, to try to just bring my overall life practice into alignment so that I can have my art practice, my theoretical writing, and my everyday writing um, be one of just thinking about what our everyday relationship is to technology, if that makes sense. Yes. And well, the, the first um, work that you show us is um, was the American Idol project. Um, what's, in general, like your opinion on um, this sort of um, subversion of established codes in, I don't know, like mass media? And have you done other projects like in a similar vein? Well, you know, I haven't so much as a visual artist lately. I was in a punk band that toured for seven years, um, starting when I was 15, believe it or not. Um, and then when I left that, I thought it was so cool. I said, I want to do something more punk than punk. <laughs> Um, classic. Uh, and so my answer was to do stuff along those lines and then to try to do writing projects and other things like that. Um, but lately I've really been thinking about wanting to get back to finding a way to do more work like that. I, I miss it. Um, and it's where my head is at right now. Yeah. No sé si alguien del público quiera preguntar algo, algún comentario. Sí, claro. Es sobre la pieza, la, la primera de American Idol. Um, I will try to speak in English. <laughs> My English is as bad as your Spanish. Lo, lo traduce. Eh, la, ella habla de esta última pieza de oro que, que pinta y eh, intenta rescatar o objetivizar estos objetos que han sido obsoletos. Y con esta pieza que, form, que hace el American Idol, ¿qué va a pasar cuando desaparezca ese tipo de plataformas? Eh, si está preocupada en cómo esa plataforma retrató un momento específico, un proyecto específico y si va a desaparecer porque ya o la va a congelar en oro también como su otra práctica. Um, well, uh, the question is about in relation to your interest in the outmoded and um, these technologies that uh, you collect and paint these outmoded technologies. She, the question is more about like 
the platforms such as American Idol and all these TV programs and the fact that one day they might be outmoded as well. And have you reflected on that? Like if that happened when these platforms become outmoded? Not, um, <laughs> this is fun. I like, I kind of like this way of communicating. I haven't thought about that so explicitly, but I really like that question. Um, and I think it's a really good one, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think it's probably already happening. For instance, this is the last season of American Idol in the United States. And meanwhile, I think part of the reason for that is because now there are Instagram stars and people. I mean, there's still a huge obsession with fame that I think was born with American Idol and that sort of thing, but I think that there isn't the same need for these TV shows. People are just bypassing it and using, um, I'm sorry, this is a long answer to translate, but you'll probably condense it. So um, they're, they're just using mobile platforms. However, there are huge talent agencies and things that exist for that. Um, I have some something else to say, but it's a side thing, so I'll let you translate that. Oh, okay, cool. Great question. Um, but there's a there's a, a different connection between the reality shows and the obsolescence that I can talk about too, which is that. It, which has to do with what, what I'm working on next. Um, it, people sometimes don't see a connection between those two bodies of work, but for me, I'm interested in the question of like improvement and how, the, like, what does it mean to make things better, make yourself better or make your phone better? We, it suggests that we always think that we're not good enough and we need to make our life better by having a better car or a better TV or better boobs or whatever, <laughs> you know, or a better mind or whatever it might be. And so I'm actually really interested in getting back to using the internet more and doing more performance as well as the sculptural stuff by thinking about um, this persona of a meditation guru, um, where it's it's this combination of all of those forms of like improvement. So, anyway, maybe other question. Muchas gracias. <laughs> gracias, Marisa.